at the end of the long night by edward h hurlbut extra extra in shrill diminuendo awakened jack lanagan from the very heart of his morning slumber the morning paper man sleeps late and nothing short of cataclysm or the cry of an extra is likely to awaken him lanagan was from his bed to the window in a lanky leap hailing the newsboy it was the evening record with a screamer head and two hundred words of blackface type lanagan swept through it in a comprehensive flash with more speed than was his custom he thereupon dressed swanson he said gad what a story he sat on the edge of the bed more leisurely to roll a brown paper cigarette and read the story more carefully stripped of flaring headlines it was as follows all hope for the safety of captain robert swanson the retired millionaire shipping man who disappeared on wednesday evening was dissipated this morning shortly after nine thirty o'clock when the body of the well-known philanthropist was found in a sub-cellar room in the notorious palace hotel in chinatown death was due to strangulation life had probably been extinct three days and it is the police theory that captain swanson went directly to the hotel or was lured there on the evening of his disappearance his watch and valuables were found on his person so far as a hasty examination could discover no one saw him enter the hotel which bears an evil reputation and is occupied by the lowest type of denizen of chinatown and the barbary coast the room where the body was found is one of several that have been dug out beneath the basement and is used entirely by opium smokers chief of police leslie has ordered all available detectives on the case and arrests are expected at any moment which means finally grumbled lanagan that i get no day off to-morrow to split a quart of chianti with mine host pastori swanson he ran quickly back in his mind is president of the seamen's bank director of the cosmos club director of a dozen corporations trustee of his church sound as a nut at sixty-five solidly established in the old conservative families of knob hill with a family of married children likewise solidly established in the solidest kind of respectability and a wife who is a silvery-haired saint if there ever was one yet he a man who probably didn't know such a place as chinatown's palace hotel existed until that night is found dead in the lowest sink of that hole the extremes of the social system met in his end and the place of it the chinatown palace hotel of the days just before the fire gave that quarter of san francisco obliteration the one thing that could cleanse it was a sorry second to the pretentious hostelry on market street a ramshackle structure illy lit through its crooked corridors and musty rooms with ancient gas jets it looked more in its complete dirt and dinginess like an exaggerated rabbit warren three stories above ground and one or two below cut up into rooms the largest not more than eight by ten the smallest just large enough for a bunk and an opium layout it had survived by some miracle the health authorities to hive in musty murk the off-scourings of a city once when portsmouth square was the civic centre it had harboured the kings of the early gold days the rooms were larger in those days the front suites that gave ease to the idling new-made creases had long since been cut up into five six seven or eight as the increasing congestion of the quarter threw an increasing swarm of vermin to its recesses save for white dope fiends known in the vernacular of the police as hops cokes or morphs users of opium cocaine or morphine it was inhabited solely by chinese some of them coolie laborers but the most of them likewise fiends below the basement floor were a dozen rooms not high enough for a man to stand erect in the light of day never entered what light they received came from one main gas jet in the corridor or the occasional flash of a policeman's pocket light as the chinatown squad made their rounds 
save for the members of the squad and at times a jaded police reporter idling from the reporter's room in the nearby hall of justice on a quiet night through the district with the squad sergeant it is probable no white man save the fiends of the district had ever before gasped for breath in that foul den no white man that is before captain robert swanson who entered there one night never to emerge it was three days before one of the denizens of the sub-cellar finally realizing that the occupant of the next bunk was not in the stupor of drug but the stiffness of death made his way with frantic hippity hoppings to the first member of the squad he could find and reported the matter not forgetting to whine for his ten cents for so doing such in substance were the facts in the mystery that set the city and the coast uh, swanson was a notable figure in shipping circles in a ferment for a week for more than the initial fact of finding the body in chinatown's cesspool five days had now elapsed with not one single additional fact of consequence to clear the mystery suspects without number had been jailed every ex-convict fiend vagrant or questionable character of the district white yellow or black male or female had been put through the police mill the opium dens had been emptied of their wastrels blinking like bats in the light of day swanson's past and his present life were run under a high-power lens his servants and his employees lives and the lives of his former servants and former employees Chief Leslie was a fellow member of the Cosmos Club with Swanson, and if any additional good to his natural police pride were necessary to spur him on, that afforded it. Every recourse that police experience could adapt or devise was applied. Always there was lacking motive, that mainspring for crime. That Swanson had by any chance been addicted to the drug habit was early dismissed, practically every hour of his methodical life could be accounted for for months back but in so far as his movements were concerned from the moment he left his doorstep on wednesday evening until the body was found he may as well have left his doorstep invested in an invisible mantle for no living person that could be located had seen him alive there was one peculiar circumstance he had worn that night a heavy ulster overcoat although the night had not been chilly and mrs swanson had remarked on it at parting the coat was not found with the body it is not exaggeration to say that in physical output lanagan worked harder than any three reporters or detectives during the first five days of the case he did not take me into his confidence he seldom did until the smash approached on any story he smoked eternally or chewed to pulp his own select brand of rank manilas or consumed innumerable cigarettes lanagan never had to bother with the daily routine of a story that was left to me his work was the big feature stuff he might not write a line for a week and then he would saunter into the picture with a new sensation that would upend the town but there seemed to be no upending on this case during the five days that had elapsed the big portion of the work had fallen to me lanagan had absolutely not turned a trick on wednesday evening at midnight as i turned in my story for the day identical as i felt it would be for the other two morning papers lanagan phoned me to meet him at the hall of justice i drifted down there i just wanted to tell you was his greeting that i am going to disappear don't look for me i will discover myself when the time comes i'm going to lose myself up in chinatown for the solution of that story is there and i'm not coming till i've landed something and choked off the side remarks of the times and herald outfit if i stay there for the balance of my natural life the police can hang as they please to their oary old dogma that a hophead never commits murder just because they're so positive i am going to take the other tack at least until i have proved their theory to my own satisfaction there isn't a man outside the frequenters of this quarter knew of that sub-cellar and that's the theory i'm going to stick with now 
keep in pretty close touch with the offices so i can get you in a hurry if anything turns up good-bye in another moment he was walking rapidly up washington street to disappear down dupont out of sight for three days the story had run eight days and a dearth of fresh angles had thinned it out a trifle when on saturday evening along about ten o'clock as i hung around the local room hoping against hope for a call from lanagan it came meet me in front of old st mary's he said shortly and i thrilled instantly with that same premonitory tremor that always came over me when the climax was on i sped down kearney street and in the shadow of the church steps picked him up dorrit is watching me he said he's been covering me for days dorrit was the oldest special policeman in chinatown and generally held to be a leak for the herald through personal friendship for a former police reporter now city editor of that paper in such fashion do papers develop their sources of news i have one clue that may be the key to the solid brick wall we have been up against and i am not going to lose that key to the herald via dorrit concluded lanagan as he suddenly stepped fully into the glare of the gas street lamp on the corner just as dorrit sidled up i saw that lanagan had deliberately exposed himself really dorrit he remarked in that sinister tone he could assume so well on occasion some of these days i shall actually trip over you if you persist in blundering beneath my feet you might fall quite hard in that case and hurt yourself however just tell cartwright uh, city editor of the herald that i am going to hand him a package of nitroglycerin right on your own particular little bailiwick will you please run along now like a good little special policeman because we are going to lose you thusly he turned on his heel and ran for a california street car just lumbering past us up the hill and i followed suit after a few blocks he crossed through the car and dropped off on the other side scouting cautiously back toward chinatown by way of washington street drifting along with eyes wide for dorrit we finally made ross alley where lanagan stopped for a fraction of a second at the wicket of the gambling house at number eight at that time it was a strict rule of the gambling joints that a white man could not enter personally for all of my four years dubbing around on police i never had been able to enter a chinese gambling house when the play was on yet the lookout flashed one glance at lanagan grinned yellowly and ingenuously and the massive solid oak door before us swung noiselessly open and we passed quickly through as it shut behind us i heard a faint click click and glanced back three separate two-by-four scantlings heavily reinforced with iron had dropped back into their sockets the door was as solid as a concrete wall against the axes of the chinatown squad the theory being that by the time the squad had the door battered down the players had departed through some secret runway melodrama laughed lanagan at me but i had to come by the back door as it were i wouldn't like to have any stray police or reporters or dorrit suspect i was about to interview the man i am they might smell a rat possibly we are more isolated among these hundred chinks gambling their fool heads off than we would be in one of leslie's dark cells we passed directly through the long room with its eight high tables at each of which ten or a dozen impassive celestials with chopsticks beans and teacups stood engaged in the contraband pastime of fantan at a table or two a pie gal game was running and in a corner dominoes the air was so heavy and heated that i felt the perspiration starting in an instant the chinese gambler if he is winning sticks in that thick atmosphere for hours at a time at the rear of the room was another door likewise barred in triplicate here another lookout grinned friendly at lanagan and pressed on an innocent-looking nail-head in the wainscoting and the bars dropped and the door opened to a steep ladder we went down about ten feet into a blind areaway between two buildings it was as black as your derby hat 
but lanagan the marvellous stepped ahead with assurance and i followed him gropingly in another moment he rapped faintly on what i took to be a section of the brick base of the building a click sounded he took me by the arm pulled me after him another click and the next moment a blaze of electric light discovered us to be in a small lounging room elaborately appointed in oriental furnishings hello miss lanmigan the voice came from a corpulent twinkling-eyed richly garbed chinaman just arisen from a massive chair of ebony and mother of pearl hello foo said lanagan sinking into another massive chair and motioning me to do likewise my friend norton foo norton mr foo wong otherwise known to me as why because you will understand why because presently why because i tell you said fu wong chuckling him funny boy miss lamigan him what do you call em jolly me you like em smoke he pressed a button on the arm of his chair and a flowing garbed chinese boy appeared with rich havanas on a tray together with individual teacups and two-piece teapots for three did you find c wong lanagan asked abruptly while i studied fu whom i knew by reputation as one of the chinese merchant princes i am in a hurry fu i catch em he say charlie drive automobile charlie live there three or four weeks she cry one time see bring em tea oh charlie charlie why for you do him what's mala you charlie she stop quick see see why because see he don't know he say charlie he use em what you call em hop for the first time since this story broke that singular flashing almost like a cat's eyes flamed into lanagan's dark eyes and they shot a responsive shiver of high tension interest through me because i knew that at last he had struck the trail you have done more for me than i can ever repay said lanagan at parting you are a remarkable man fu wong fu laughed boyishly why because you saved my stole good name i help you as we went back out the way we came in lanagan enlightened me fu is president of the sui sing tong there is a chinaman swanson's cook si wong whom i have been hammering on for two days of all the household servants i have a vague suspicion of him i couldn't land him finally i looked up his affiliation found he was a sui sing man and then i enlisted the services of fu wong si wong would have to talk to his tong leader where the police or the reporters couldn't drag information out of him with a team of mules he purely and simply wouldn't sabe and that's all the satisfaction you could get why because is not only proprietor of one of the biggest bazaars here and a director of the chinese bank but he is also proprietor i am telling you chinatown secrets and not to be repeated of uh, the gambling house we came through and several others he is one of the powers of the quarter there was an english tourist robbed in his bazaar once of a couple of hundred dollars and i was sent up here fu labored under the impression that the entire sixteen pages of the inquirer were going to be turned over to that particular robbery he felt the disgrace of the thing keenly as any high-class chinaman would and personally offered the englishman back the money that was a good story for some reason fu not understanding the american newspaper idea of human interest elected to think i had written a eulogy of him deliberately i could have had half his store at that time i guess if i had wanted it but i took a cigar and a cup of tea and ever since that time i have been taken inside the inner circle up here the room we were in is a runway through the basement of the bazaar next door in case of a raid charlie was a chauffeur named thorn employed by mrs swanson about three months ago for several weeks he was one of the numerous wastrels that that woman of unostentatious but magnificent charities had under her protection there are scores in and about the city men and women boys and girls that she had taken from the underside of life and put on top i didn't see him but some of leslie's men did and found nothing suspicious 
had they known he was a hop however they might have thought differently it establishes a very clear apparent connection between swanson and the palace hotel and the only definite clue that has been turned up we will save a lot of time by getting his address from leslie lanagan was through with leslie in a few moments he is going home but will be on tap with brady and wilson if we need him later he said he got curious when i mentioned thorne but promised to lay off until he heard from me thorne lives at lombard and larkin where in view of mrs swanson's undoubted suspicion that he committed the crime coupled with c wong's charge that he is a hop we will now proceed to call on him we were there in a few moments it was a squalid lodging house in charge of a slatternly beldame she didn't know whether thorne was in or not he was kind of loony lately she thought too bad said lanagan genially has charlie been so that he couldn't be out the last week he wasn't feeling well last time i saw him ain't seen much of him this week she replied i didn't know about it but i'm beginning to think he's one of them there fiends he is actin somethin awful sometimes lately what with his skippin and hoppin you can go on up the door was locked but it was a rickety affair and the lock yielded to the pressure of our shoulders a man who might have been any age from twenty to forty swung himself to a sitting position on a disordered bed and glared at us with eyes that were wide open but only half seeing full a hop and i might as well jam him on a gamble said lanagan in an aside to me as he stepped quickly over and pulled thorn to his feet slapped him across the face and sat him down in a chair a high-pitched querulous protest was voiced at the treatment and then thorne whimpered oh you are so cruel what have i ever done to be treated so cruelly he began to cry done you sniveling viper put on your shoes and come with me to jail you murdered robert swanson and you are going to hang for it get up and come along again lanagan caught him a sharp slap across the face this time thorne did not whimper a look of cunning came into his eyes. "'Getting your wits back pretty quick now, huh?' sneered Lanagan. Thorne stared. It seemed for a moment his clouded eyes entirely cleared, and then the film of the drug-sodden brain fell over his eyes again, and he relapsed to his hunched position. He was shivering and rocking himself, his angular knees drawn up to his chin, clasped around with his arms. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear!' His voice was pitched high again like a woman's. Why, is everyone so cruel to me? I'm very nervous, as you can see, gentlemen. I really need something to quiet my nerves. It is the doctor's orders, really. Would it be asking too much now to ask for the loan of ten cents? Oh, dear. Thorn, said Lanigan, his aspect actually ferocious, leaped before the half-arisen suppliant. I shrank back myself. His acting was so consummately done. I'll give you ten cents, you viper, you murdering, crawling, poisonous viper. I'll give you the condemned cell at San Quentin, and the death watch, and the black cap, and the quick drop, until they crack that snake's head of yours into a dozen pieces. That's what I'll give you. Chattering, jabbering incoherently, his long, lean, sharp-nailed, claw-like hands working spasmodically before his face, and toward lanagan the fiend huddled back he glanced from side to side his head lolling as though seeking some avenue of escape by a desperate leap lanagan's eyes were within a foot of his face thorne began to foam at the mouth i thought he was going into a fit as i watched fascinated the horrible scene bearing down upon the wretch with savagery in his voice and manner lanagan hammered on give you ten cents what do you want with ten cents you'll never get another shot of coke as long as you live thorn never in this world you are coming with me now coming where you will never need coke again coming to your death by hanging for murder not another shot in all this world will you ever get with a shriek that was more animals than man's thorn suddenly lunged forward quicker than the dart of a snake's head those hands with their long lean writhing fingers had twisted around lanagan's neck 
with a strength that was the strength of temporary insanity he flung lanagan from him and fell with him then like a lean gorilla he shook lanagan's head from side to side while he screeched fearful imprecations you lie you lie i'll get all i want that's what he said and i killed him and i'll kill you too yeah yeah he trailed away into a maniacal scream i hurled myself at him but the fiend for the moment at least had the strength of three men i finally managed to get in a blow that settled him lanagan rubbing his bruised neck ruefully rose slowly he was panting a little but chuckling score one for mental suggestion on a weak subject he laughed but i didn't figure those scrawny hands had quite that much strength this murder is clearer than print we all but reenacted the scene now my boy to establish the connection that would bring a man of swanson's position to a rendezvous at the palace to arouse the slumbering demon in this human orangutan it's rather a commentary on that hoary police doctrine that a dope fiend never commits murder i was right within thirty minutes chief leslie and brady and wilson his right-hand men were in the room and lanagan swiftly detailed the circumstances thorne had come too and was shaking and shivering as the drug wore out of his system leaving him nerve-racked he did not attempt to repudiate his utterance but sullenly admitted the murder in view of the words overheard by c wong there was but one person to clear up the mystery leslie lanagan and i hurried in the chief's machine to the swanson home nearly midnight as it was that they had had thorn once under examination and had permitted him to go was a source of bitter chagrin to the chief thorn showed none of the ravages of the habit that men of weaker physique exhibited the day the police picked him up he had happened to be comparatively normal and consequently he had passed safely through the quiz mrs swanson had not yet retired and upon learning that the chief was one of her late callers summoned us at once to the drawing-room she had one of those splendid faces seen occasionally in the aged where strength of mind or religious fervor has brought endurance of lifelong secret pain of body or soul the calmness of a noble resignation looked forth in a slight clouding of her clear eyes and expressed itself in the faint traces of suppression about her mobile lips the gleaming snow-white hair combed straight back from a forehead of a remarkable breadth in a woman invested her like an aureole she was a woman probably of sixty years you will appreciate gentlemen i trust she said in a low voice of refined modulation that i have endured much and am still suffering it is a very painful errand we are on mrs swanson and we will endeavour to be brief said lanagan in a voice that a chesterfield might have envied for courteous inflection and gentleness of expression but nevertheless it is an errand that must be performed he glanced at the chief who nodded speaking as a newspaper man continued lanagan it is my wish at all times to spare the feelings of those particularly women with whom i am brought into relation but the true newspaper man is a seeker after truth and he must follow as definite a path as the police follow there was an eloquent pause she gazed from one to the other during the interim as though striving to read their thoughts it was evident that the undercurrent that these skilled cross-examiners intended to convey had carried home well finally neither lanagan nor leslie spoke there was another pause she said at last you have some information to impart to me or some information to seek we desire to inform you said leslie slowly and with just a shade more of hardness in his tone as the detective began to work in him that we have under arrest the confessed murderer of your husband she leaned involuntarily forward in her chair and grasped the arm so hard that her knuckles showed white through the fair skin of her hands and we desire to inform you added lanagan quickly that the name of your husband's murderer is charles thorne 
and we desire to ask you what the motive was for the murder of your husband by charles thorne and why when you suspected that charles thorne was the murderer you did not immediately notify the police her hands slowly relaxed their grip on the chair arms as she sank back into its depths curiously in the way the light struck down at her hair and her face it seemed that the beautiful halo of white that had invested her and the delicate well-preserved whiteness of her skin turned suddenly to dirty gray if ever the blight of age settled visibly in fact or in fiction it settled upon her then you have charles thorne under arrest she said and her very tone was gray she did not deny the truth of the charge she did not express satisfaction that the murderer was found she merely asked whether they had charles thorne under arrest yes her eyes closed and her head dropped suddenly back against the chair we stepped swiftly forward but before we could take any measures to revive her her eyes had opened again the lips moved she was speaking but so gaspingly that we bent to hear it is the end of a long night she said with many halts the end of the long night a life's nightmare is done god have mercy on me she stopped completely then god pity all mothers who bear as i bore another long pause she was by strong effort retaining the clarity of her faculties under some heavy shock she repeated who bear as i bore the silence became acutely poignant it must be told she breathed finally you have asked me why i did not tell you my suspicions i will tell you now charles thorne her next words came so low that had it not been for the pregnant silence of the great drawing-room they would not have heard is my son i found i had been holding my breath and i glanced quickly at lanagan to see his breast falling with a deep exhalation my husband did not know she continued colourlessly charles thorne does not know i am his mother i have tried to live a full christian life i have given by tens of thousands to aid the erring i have thought to make all atonement and yet the blood of my blood slew the heart of my heart my dear husband one of god's noble men after that wrenching confession her normal poise began by degrees to return as the strength of an extraordinary mind began to assert itself the story was soon told of an alliance before her marriage to swanson of the boy taken by the father to be sent back to her after fifteen years the dissolute father on his deathbed sent charles back to the mother for fifteen years since that day she had steadily stood sponsor for the boy to her husband he was but one of the many others of her objects of charity it may be said the boy inherited the dissolute traits of his father finally her own children by swanson all marrying that profound mysterious quality of motherhood prompted her to make one last effort to redeem the boy under her own eyes and she adopted the dangerous course for her of bringing him to the house as a chauffeur that he was given to drugs she did not know thorne had been caught in a series of petty thefts swanson had finally been compelled to discharge him he had left the house with maledictions upon swanson instinctively she had felt he was the author of the crime considering all of these circumstances and understanding the character of the fiend and his paternity it is evident that in his brain constantly weakening under drugs became fixed a sinister purpose to work out some scheme of revenge on swanson for driving him from a rich home and a cosy living with ample funds and opportunity for a secret indulgence in his weakness 
as it subsequently appeared thorne did not originally plan murder some abortive scheme of blackmail had but half formed in his crazy brain he lured swanson with a cunning letter full of explicit directions to the palace hotel by writing that he was seriously ill there he begged that mrs swanson be not informed until after swanson had seen him he wanted an opportunity to redeem himself he wrote and swanson as warm-hearted as his wife and not caring evidently to worry her needlessly about the condition of one of her charges until he had made an investigation set out on his errand of humanity never to return he wore his ulster obviously so that he would not be recognized going alone into the palace hotel in the sub-cellar he had met thorne there was a prolonged talk and swanson made the mistake of chiding the fiend on his habits desire coming upon him strongly thorne finally exhibited himself in all his ugly weakness and the spectacle was too much for the eyes of swanson unaccustomed to such sights he was stooping his way out of the little room after sternly refusing thorne's appeal for money when the long lean fingers of the half insane man with some congenital strain outcropping perhaps of that vagabond dissolute father found an easy goal in a man already half suffocated in the thick air of the place alarmed when his fit had passed at what he had done and fearing to rob the body thorne had quakingly slipped into swanson's ulster and made his way in terror to his own room first he had journeyed to the foot of powell street weighted the coat with a rock and cast it into the water of the bay it was subsequently recovered and served as the single bit of incriminating evidence to substantiate his confession his letter to swanson in swanson's pocket he had taken with him to destroy by tearing into fine bits such were the salient features of a most extraordinary crime as ultimately established but to return to mrs swanson's drawing-room where lanagan is speaking charles thorne does not know then that you are his mother he does not know who does know no living person save myself and uh, you gentlemen in that case then mrs swanson said lanagan simply your secret will die with us she choked in attempting to speak and tears streaming from her eyes bade us each adieu for my part i confess i was blinking like a boy the outer doors closed behind us then back to the room for you chief snapped lanagan laconically throw thorne in at two fifteen charles thorne a former chauffeur murdered swanson after attempted to blackmail failed you stand of course chief stand jack replied that sterling officer it's in so deep it can only come out when the last drop leaves my veins i knew that said lanagan now nori sharply get together we have exactly 55 minutes to press time. End of At the End of the Long Night.